Hello my dears, welcome to today's video which was going to be a short little deep dive into some sketchy research history and then ended up becoming an entire major deep dive including an existential crisis on the nature of language, communication, humanity, and uh, existence because I'm incapable of making things easy for myself apparently. So glad to have you here. Let's do this. Image description for friends who need it. I'm a white person in their early 20s with shoulder length light brown curly hair. I am currently wearing a white button up shirt. I am sitting in front of a bookshelf. And if you're like, who are you? Hi, uh, my name is Sydney. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an openly queer, disabled, autistic, trans, non-binary actor, composer, educator, and disability advocate. Currently working on a thesis about all of that, plus disability education, media, theater, performance, accessible education, all of those things in any and all of those categories. It's culminating in the world's first all neurodivergent cast and crew production of The Curious Incident of the Dog in the nighttime. You can learn about all those things at the link in my description. Also, I don't know when this video is going up, but we're about to post stuff about ticket stuff soonish. So if you want to come see it, follow us on Instagram. Anyway, also other things to know because they relate to my qualifications for this video specifically, I used to work as a teacher. I also worked as a service dog trainer until recently. And one of my special interests is linguistics. I speak about six languages. American Sign Language is one of them. So the discussion of what qualifies as language, of how children develop linguistic skills, and also of animal behavior all exist right in my little realm of nerdiness mixed with life experience. So. Let's dive in. Also, there will be brief discussions of animal abuse in this video, but I will not be graphic and they will be very, very brief, I promise. Now, understandably, we've always thought, can animals talk? Can we teach animals to talk with us? And throughout history, there's always been that question of can we teach animals to communicate? One example of this is Sir John Lubbock. He did experiments in the late 1800s, one of which where he trained his dog to pick up different cards with different words on them to express what he wanted. There was also research into whether any animals have the physical capabilities of producing speech like humans do, particularly in primates, to see if we could teach other animals English. It was concluded that resoundingly no. Um, one of the studies about this was conducted in the 1930s when Gua the chimp was raised as though she was a human child alongside an actual human child um, of the scientists for about nine months. And they realized that Gua was not acquiring human language and the human child was acquiring chimp language. So they ended the study. There's also the Vicky study that was similar, but she did not have a human sibling. She also went to speech therapy and was also unsuccessful. That's a story for another day. The point here is that human vocal cords are uniquely human. So apes learning to speak English just isn't happening. Apes do, however, have very similar hands to humans and therefore could, in theory, learn sign language. We'll get there. We're, we're gonna get there. The first signing ape was Bouchot, who was a chimpanzee caught in the wild who went to live with Bee and Robert Allen Gardner in June of 1966. They tried to make her environment as similar as possible to what a human infant with deaf parents would experience in hopes that she would acquire sign language developmentally the way that humans do. This meant that every researcher communicated with her in sign and minimized their use of speech or didn't use it altogether. She ended up with a vocabulary of about 350 signs, though she could only use about 150 signs effectively, and based on the published research, the experiment seemed to be as Success. According to their writing, she babbled with her hands. Hand babbling is a thing. Um, she imitated other people's signs. She was able to generalize words to several different kinds of the same thing. She picked up signs from watching other signs. She signed without being prompted. And she would combine signs in unique ways to try to explain things, such as seeing a swan and signing water bird. She also taught signs to some other chimpanzees. It is important to note that the gardeners were not linguists. They were not ASL signers, nor did they appear to be familiar with the growing field of child language acquisition. Robert Allen Gardner was an ethologist, which is a scientist who studies animal behavior, and B. Gardner was a zoologist. Also, they had worked in secret, keeping their raw data to themselves, had released only carefully selected material. After the experiment finished when she was five, she went to live at an institute of primate studies in Oklahoma, where it was reported that they found a show of enormous size, vastly overweight, frantic for candy, and all of their sweets that had been her rewards during training. Do with all that information what you will. The groundbreaking experiment inspired lots of other people to try to teach sign language to chimps. Enter the 1970s obsession with acquiring apes and teaching them sign language. And no, they were not always acquired legally. Or they were acquired legally, but then you actually do any research past the legal stuff and you're like, why did they believe that story when they got this ape? This is very sketchy. Now, the one who was the original inspiration for this video is Coco the Gorilla, who you have probably heard of. Robin Williams had a whole stand-up bit about meeting her. She was also friends with Mr. Rogers. She's kind of well-known in pop culture. That's purposeful. Um, she lived to be about 46 years old and she died in 2018. Throughout her life, she was recorded as learning nearly a thousand signs. I saw that number in a few sources and a few other sources said that her working vocabulary was about 375 and she knew as many as 645. So 
Numbers generally run there. According to published research, she learned vocabulary developmentally similarly to typical human children. She combined words and created sentences. She talked about abstract things such as personality and feelings. She also lied. Um, and she talked about things that she remembered, showing that she had some sense of the concept of time. She was born in 1971 at the San Francisco Zoo, but around the age of one got life-threateningly ill, and so she went to the hospital. She then needed constant care for a couple years, and so she was loaned to Penny Patterson and Charles Pasternak so that they could take care of her for a few years and also use her in their research at the same time. She was raised on both spoken English and sign language and lived out the rest of her life in the care of Penny with support from the Gorilla Foundation. Also, for the record, Penny is a psychologist with specialties in developmental and animal psych. At the same time, there was another study being carried out at Columbia University by psychologist Herbert S. Terrace and psycholinguist Thomas Beaver. They structured their experiment similarly to Wishows, and this chimp was named Nim Chimpsky, which if you're a linguist, you will find this quite funny. It is a pun. Um, if you're not, the father of modern linguistics is named Noam Chomsky. So they... Chimsky. Anyway, Nim learned 125 signs, though Terrace concluded that he had not acquired language as defined by Chomsky. He noticed that the chimp never signed to himself like kids learning a language typically do. He did not follow developmental stages typical of learning language. He'd never initiated conversation, and he only signed to mimic caregiver prompts. And a lot of researchers on the project have come out to say the exact same things. Also, rather than construct sentences or meaningful strings of words, he would just have his hands constantly moving, trying to brute force a bunch of signs until he would get the eventual reward. He compared this to a combination of operant conditioning and the clever Hans effect, where animals pick up on subconscious cues to deduce what a human wants them to do, even if the human isn't consciously aware that they're giving cues at all. It's named after clever Hans, a horse who could supposedly answer math questions in the early 1900s by tapping his foot as many times as the answer. He could even do fractions, but in reality, he was actually just detecting how his handler would ever so slightly tense up and then relax once Hans got to the correct number, so he would know when to stop to make his handler happy. The effect was discovered because Hans was unable to correctly answer questions when he could no longer see his handler. Basically, the chimps could learn signs, sure, but they were incapable of language. He published this in a paper titled Can an Ape Create a Sentence in 1979, and he also published an article called Why Coco Can't Talk in 1982. In response, many psychologists supported him. After all, the study was kind of the first major one where a well-known psychologist and a linguist look into this phenomenon and conducted a somewhat easily peer-reviewed and looked at study sharing their raw data, unlike the other signing apes that we've learned about thus far. Others, such as the head of the place that Wisho had retired to, said, actually, we fundamentally disagree, um, citing confirmation bias on Terrace's side because he had been generally annoyed by chimp language studies and very open about that for a while before conducting his own, and reporting that the community of ASL using chimps in his care were all using sign language with one another and teaching it to their children without human help or intervention. Coco's handler, Penny Patterson, responded by basically going, you know, you're just trying to discredit us because you're just like, you're jealous that yours failed and ours didn't. Specifically calling out how Nim had worked with a lot of different handlers and therefore could not create a strong enough bond for full communication. And that sure, apes mimic signs, but humans also mimic sounds or signs and that eventually gives way to full language. Now we will get into Terrace's ableist views of what counts as communication in a bit, but what I can say is that in comparison to other studies where the papers have been more descriptive without data um, and the fact that everybody who works with Coco was required to sign an NDA and that most of the film behind data analysis and also raw data from other ape studies has never been released and all of the stuff that we know about Coco's care that we're going to talk about in a second, I'm leaning more towards Terrace's view than I am the other ones. But it's something to think about. We'll get there. Now, normally I would do an excessive amount of research to try and answer all my questions and solidly pick a side on this one. You will see why no matter how much research one does on this, the answers are still sketchy later in this video. But that aside, trying to research the actual data for all of these studies and find the published research is in infuriating because Coco the Gorilla became such a brand that there are so many articles saying things that are just not backed up by anything anywhere else. They're all anecdotal evidence and all other writings and all other studies inevitably link back to Coco and it is a confusing research disastrous mess. Either way, regardless of what you or I may think about this, after this paper was published and this debate was had, funding for chimp research was just cut across the board. By this point on, most research would be done on an observational level with apes who'd already been studied and were growing up in captivity rather than continuously studying new apes, but also most apes formerly in studies were simply just put into sanctuaries or other facilities where they were not cared for or interacted with enough, unfortunately. But anyway, let's talk about American Sign Language. If you want to learn more about it, I got a video about ASL as a form of AAC, which is Alternative and Augmentative Communication. We're also going to talk about that later in the video. You can check that video out up here. You should. ASL is really great. Now the thing about ape researchers who used ASL for their studies is that 
The vast majority of them did not actually know sign language or even consider it to be a real language with grammar and lore and culture and all of that kind of stuff like any other language has. They primarily learned a handful of signs and they used them with English grammatical structure, which is fundamentally not ASL. Penny also had this whole thing about talking about how Coco would sometimes mess up signing because she would say pink instead of drink, and those are confusing because they rhyme, even though those are auditory rhymes, and rhyming conventions in ASL are completely different, and those two signs are in fact very different from each other. I will say this argument is a bit wishy-washy because Coco was raised on both ASL and spoken language, so she may have been translating from thinking in sound to the signs she wanted to do, but A, that's kind of a stretch, and B, the fundamental issue here is that her handler clearly did not know really anything about sign language, which then puts into question the validity of her experiment in the first place because she didn't actually know what she was studying. It's also important to note that ASL is not just on the hands. Your facial expression or the spatial location of your sign can completely change the meaning of a sentence. And we also know that some signs are physically impossible for primate hands to make. In fact, all of the researchers acknowledged this in all of their research. And this is usually used as an argument as to why they couldn't learn sign language. I do get that, but I do think that it discredits the fact that sign language is modified all of the time for deaf people with various physical disabilities, such as only having one arm or having cerebral palsy or not being able to do certain things with your hands. Those things will also fundamentally change the language and it is still considered ASL and understood within the deaf community. However, the fact that this sign language is modified on a lot of levels by changing some hand shapes and a less strict signing space and English grammar and no associated grammatical facial expressions and whatnot, it's enough things that are changed that it's pretty hard to see it as a version of ASL. And some researchers did acknowledge this and they called it guerrilla sign language, others did not. It was very unclear to me whether researchers were aware to the extent of which this was not ASL at the time, which again puts the validity of their results sort of into question because their criteria for studying it was sketchy to begin with. But anyway, when I first learned about this, I remembered that sign language was not actually classified by linguists as a full language with a grammatical structure and whatnot until fairly late in the game. So I wanted to give them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe they started this research before the linguistic declaration happened. But the first study started in 1966. This was 11 years after the 1955 research was initially published on the linguistic structure of ASL as a language. So that is a nope. And then a linguistic study in layman's terms of ASL by William Stokoe, which I have read and it is fairly easy read for anybody new to linguistics, highly, highly recommended, um, was published in 1965. They also hired deaf people to work on the day-to-day -day care. So they knew what they were doing. There's also this book that I quoted earlier called The Other Side of Silence by Arda Neisser that I read as a part of an independent study years ago where he talked about this history and interviewed some of the deaf people who worked on the experiments. They overwhelmingly talked about how things were recorded as signs that were not even close to the correct sign. Think like when you want your dog to lay down and instead they sit and you're like, close enough, and you give them a treat and say they did it anyway. One interview was with someone who worked with one of the other chimps on the Wisho project, and I'm just gonna read the entire quote because it tells us a lot. I wasn't there long. There was a very high turnover among the deaf. The gardeners wouldn't listen to anything the deaf people told them about ASL. They thought we didn't know anything about it and we were just trying to make trouble. There were three shifts in a day. I'd go in, wake up the chimp, change the diapers and put clothes on, sit him in a chair and warm up milk, just like for children. I put a little bit of milk in the cup and I waited for the sign drink, thumb and mouth. I made the drink sign, waited. When he made it, I'd put a few drops in the cup and wait for the sign again. He folded his hands and sat back, waiting. By this time, the chimp was screaming. Even I could hear it. I wasn't supposed to give any food until he made the eat sign. I watched really carefully. The chimp's hands are moving constantly. Maybe I missed something, but I don't think so. I just wasn't seeing any signs. The hearing people were logging every movement the chimp made as a sign. Every time the chimp put his finger in his mouth, they'd say, oh, he's making the sign for drink, and they'd give him some milk. For part of the day, I was just supposed to sign to the chimp about things he knew, things around the place that he knew the signs of. I signed my head off, that's what I was being paid to do, but mostly the chimp didn't seem to notice. A deaf man working on a different project in California said, I feel really uneasy about what they call signs. They made it sound as if the chimps were using signs like a language. I thought it wasn't at all. There were other reports that the chimps had a hard time memorizing the signs, that researchers completely ignored deaf workers when they went, um, that's not a correct sign, and recorded those things as signs anyway, and that researchers really did not seem to care about the discrepancy between ape sign and ASL. One specifically said, the deaf people on the project were second-class citizens. But let's widen this up a little bit for some historical context. If you are unfamiliar with deaf history, in 1880 there was this thing called the Milan Conference, where hearing educators of the deaf from around the world all gathered together and decided that the best way to teach deaf kids was to punish the use of sign language and enforce speech and lip reading. This method of teaching is called oralism, and for about 100 years, and also some schools today, this was the primary method of teaching. Students were told that their only method of communication, sign language, was vastly inferior to English, and it was 
wasn't a language and it was something primal and primitive and animalistic and they were forced to go through a school system completely unable to communicate and punished often physically for using sign language. Even today, there's a lot of intergenerational trauma about this in the deaf community, for good reason. Um, but for the deaf people who had grown up being told that their primary form of communication was unfit for humans and to unlearn that and learn to become proud of their own identity, only to have to watch that language be bastardized and taken advantage of and literally used to teach animals language, I can only imagine how difficult that would be to stomach, especially because Ape research was happening when some schools were starting to switch over to using sign language again, only for this view of the deaf language is only suitable for non-human animals and it shouldn't be used or legitimized to be used against them. And the editor of the National Geographic magazine at the time, the magazine that published a lot of research on these chimps, Coco got like a whole issue. It was a whole thing. His name was Melville Bell Grosvenor and he was the grandson of Alexander Graham Bell, who was a eugenicist, who was a primary proponent for oralism and for the eradication of deafness. Grosvenor also gave many grants to the Signing Chimp Studies, which given his background, feels a little bit like a potential conflict of interest to me personally, but do with that what you will. But let's go back to how the workers were treated and how animals were treated behind the scenes. We know the deaf workers were treated as second class citizens, that they had a high turnover rate on the projects because of this. We also know that Washoe was overfed and unhealthy, and we also know that everybody who worked with Coco the Gorilla was required to sign an NDA, which is a thing. But what we do know about Coco also doesn't look very great. It has been reported that she was not fed gorilla food, but rather human food, and was reported as being overweight and having medical issues because of it. As far as I could find, nothing was done to fix that. She also received homeopathic care rather than proper veterinary care which is interesting. And there was a sexual harassment lawsuit from two former employees against Penny Patterson because apparently Coco often signed the word nipple and Penny's response was to ask other employees to expose themselves to the gorilla, which first of all, they had to work really, really, really hard to arduously teach this ape every single sign. So why, why, would, why would they include the word nipple in her vocabulary? Alternatively, maybe she was trying to sign something else. I sure hope so, but I can't figure out what her sign for nipple actually looked like because there's no videos online. Anyway, don't like it, don't like it at all. So at the end of the day, general conclusion from ape research is that it was kind of ineffective and can generally be considered debunked if only because the intentions and the research methods were sketchy at best. So can we really trust any of the data or results that came out of them? Not really. However, there's more to the story than that, but for now, Let's just park that one in the back corner of our brains and let's look at a different case study. The whole fluent pet dogs talking using buttons thing that we see on Instagram and on TikTok and whatnot, which has been generally breaking my brain. And the more I look into it, the more confusing it gets. So let's start at the beginning. If you are unfamiliar with this whole talking dog thing, a speech language pathologist by the name of Christina Hunger trained her dog Stella to use programmable buttons of different words to communicate, which is a form of augmentative and alternative communication. Another person, Alexis Devine, decided to do this for her dog, whose name is Bunny, starting from the time that she got the dog with the outside button, which the dog mastered easily. She has since teamed up with a cognitive scientist who has a product called Fluent Pet, which is an AAC word board with program buttons that's organized using the Fitzgerald key. That is how most AAC word boards are organized, um, as well as researchers from UC San Diego. She's also super viral on TikTok. And is Bunny actually able to talk? Let's break it down. Now, the first thing to keep in mind is confirmation bias. We saw this with Coco too. She would use a sign at random and the hammers would create some sort of elaborate reason as to why she used that sign or picked one over the other rather than admit that she might just be spitballing in the same way that a random child might just say a word. And you're like, why did you just say banana out of the blue? And they're like, I don't know, but maybe you'll create a whole story as to why they randomly said banana out of the blue when they could have just said a word. For example, Coco would interject the word nipple into every conversation and Penny would be like, well, it rhymes with people. So she probably meant people or at the time that she seemed to refer to herself using the sign for queen, which she'd only seen like three or four times before. And the handlers were all like, oh, she's so self-confident to call herself a queen, which she could have just, I don't know, accidentally done a new sign out of nowhere with no purpose behind it. Or she could have been repeating a sign that she'd heard and there was no meaning, but like people are more likely to see significance in one positive button pressing moment than in the nine trials where the buttons pressed made no sense. And people are also likely to create meaning from random buttons pressed. We want to believe that this thing works. So we figured out ways to convince ourselves that it works, which I think describes the results of both the studies saying that ape language worked and those that also described that ape language didn't work. There was too much emotional, uh, like sunk cost fallacy. We put in so much energy for this. 
we need it to come out with results. And what are those results gonna be? And then there's confirmation bias because you're looking for results. There's also the question of cherry picking data, whether intentional or not. Like, of course, the unsuccessful attempts at communication are less interesting, but from the perspective of me, somebody seeing this animal regularly on TikTok, how do I know if this successful communication is something that happens several times a day or once a week? Or how do I know that it's not edited? Like, I want to trust this handler. I want to trust everybody has great intentions. Alexis has spoken before about how she's not quite sure what's going on and why it's working so well. But I also know that a lot of the video that we have of Coco the gorilla is highly edited and you can't always tell. And that's from a time period when editing always looked terrible. So we're at a point where it's pretty easy for editing to look pretty seamless. And there's also a question of conflict of interest as well. Like sure, the creator of Fluent Pet could have found Bunny and genuinely been like, hey, I was actually working on this thing. Do you want some of my equipment for free to help you on your journey? But also could be a deliberate business choice to market his own product. And because of Bunny's success, he's been selling his product a lot, including stuff on how you can join the research with your own pet. And again, I want to believe the best intentions, but capitalism and also their website's vibes just feel off. And I thought that maybe I was just because I was clouded by the research, so I sent it to a couple friends without contacts and asked them what they thought of this thing that I found and they all gave me very similar answers. So it's not, it's not just a me thing. Anyway, as somebody who has spent a lot of time working with dogs, I have some clearer answers on this than I did with the, with the ape thing. We know dogs can learn words and can connect them to meaning. That has been proven in lots of studies in even MRI studies. And it's also just been proven in life. Like we know this, they learn the names of their toys and they're humans and they know what the word walk means. This is usually taught either intentionally or unintentionally via conditioning. If you say, want to go on a walk before every single walk by the third or fourth time around, when you say, Hey, want to go for a walk? They're going to start to get excited for that walk. When you say that word, they're going to connect those dots because dogs are really smart and they connect to everything. If you continuously talk about a certain toy and call it that name, they're going to start to associate that name with that toy and may start to fetch that toy when you say its name. So Bunny learned the word for outside because she hit the button for outside and she was brought outside. She connected those dots and she now uses that to communicate that she needs to go out. It's just a different way of how some dogs might ring a bell on the door when they have to go out or they will bonk their face into somebody's leg and then drag them to the door when they need to go out. The thing that works that gets the uh, result that they want is the thing that they're going to learn to do more of. In regards to buttons, they might notice that a human will get more excited when they string several buttons together rather than just using one button. And so they're going to do that more. They will notice the human gets more excited when the sentences are coherent. So they might start to structure sentences in similar ways. Think of it like, <laughs> I want to explain what it's like to do a shaping exercise, but it's really hard to explain that without just actively doing it. Um, think of this like a big game of hot and cold. You step forward, and they say cold, so you step back. And then they say warmer, and you're like, oh, so you step forward in a different direction. And then you hear cold, so you step back to the warmer area. You're gonna keep spitballing random ideas until one hits, and then you're gonna continue doing that rewarded behavior until you get closer to the final goal. Sometimes you know what you're doing, and you can connect the dots between other experiences and expectations from that person, and sometimes you've absolutely no idea, and you're just going based on the cues that you've learned. And sometimes the cues that you've learned lead you astray. For example, um, we train our dogs their whole lives. You should not jump on things. Jumping is bad. Don't do that. And then we need them to jump up on the wall to turn on light switches. And that's around when they're a lot older and getting them to like shape them to get and jump up on the wall is really, really difficult because in their brains, we keep trying to be like, do this, do this, do this. And they're like, no, I'm not allowed to. I'm not allowed to. There's a block there. They may have completely different expectations of what you want to do and you don't know what's in their head and they don't know what's in yours. Sometimes they know what they're doing and sometimes they have absolutely no idea. And the person who's giving those cues is also learning too. They have to figure out what each cue means, what hot means, what cold means, and how to communicate their expectations to the learner. This is called shaping. This is how we teach dogs new skills and ways to let them autonomously figure it out. And often when the shaping game is done and we move on and I go back to not paying 100% attention to the dog and their behavior, the dog gets kind of frustrated and for attention and treats, we'll go back trying to repeat the same behavior or restart the shaping game because they want that attention again. They want attention. They want to please you. They want treats. They're learning what gets them rewards and what's in the right direction. And they have learned that certain behaviors translate to certain responses already. And when they end up doing the thing that we want, we think that it's because they finally understand it conceptually when more often than not, it's just an algorithmic understanding of expectations that we have conditioned for them. So in the sense of talking being, I understand all of these words and can construct sentences in order to communicate with my human the way they communicate with me, they probably cannot talk, particularly with the trend of including like, please, or question, or I love you, or a thank you button, or how Coco the gorilla has a video talking about climate change and needing to save the earth. 
These things are uniquely human concepts that have developed over years of culture and philosophy that, given that dogs do not live their daily lives as humans fully interacting with and understanding human culture, it would make no sense for them to understand the depth of those concepts. It's less of a, thank you, I am very grateful for this thing, and more of a, when somebody gives you something, they tend to say thank you. I was given a thing, I guess I hit the thank you button now. Sometimes. Dogs do not have these concepts because reminder that dogs are not hardwired to understand human social norms. They're hardwired to understand dog social norms because they're a dog. And yes, there's some overlap, but also no. In the sense of learning certain buttons to get certain outcomes and using them to request those outcomes, yeah, they can totally talk and that's super cool. Alternatively, you could learn how dogs communicate and, and bond with them in a way that isn't an excessive amount of training to teach them a communication skill they can only use when they're in their house and is also wildly expensive and holds them to weirdly human standards when you can just do it for free. And that brings us to the reason that everything is a bit more complicated than it initially looks, because you can argue that no, these animals cannot communicate in language. These connections seem to be solely conditioned and not intrinsically understood. They don't acquire language the way that children do, they don't communicate the way that children do, therefore it's not language. And then that's tied into discussions of intelligence, capability, and animals, and it's about time we talk about the fact that not all humans acquire language the way that typical children do, and that we equate the ability to communicate with someone's intelligence or capability and that we hold every animal to human standards, calling our own species the most intelligent and capable of species, when I think it's frankly quite bold of us, considering that octopi can unstrew jars, regularly escape their tanks, and go rogue around aquariums, and also aren't causing climate change. But going back to the ableism thing first, Terrace's article breaking down why apes, particularly Coco, were not in fact capable of language, very clearly insinuated that anyone who could not communicate in a typical way was less than human. His paper over and over compared the study's results to that of a human child's language, and therefore concluded that no, under no circumstances is language without grammar, language, or worthy communication. And this was, during that time, historically when the primary research in atypical developmental psychology, such as, I don't know, the guy who created conversion therapy and ABA, believed that disabled children were not fully human and needed to be built from the ground up. So the historical track record of the beliefs that are being pushed with the debunking of this research is just as much of a problem as the research itself. A lot of the failures of this research had to do with the fact that the animals were not trained correctly. Part of why they didn't learn was because their handlers didn't learn and didn't know what they were doing. In the same way that you can't say a dog is a bad dog for biting all the time when the handler actively encourages biting. Part of this was the researcher's fault, which we already pointed out a while back in this video when we learned that their methodology was sketchy at best, which makes their results sketchy at best. But what this comes down to is a discussion of what counts as language. And I think that there is a confusing difference between language and a language, a distinction that researchers in this field rarely make. These apes and these dogs are capable of using language and of communicating via language. A language in the sense of a linguistic category is something that is categorized and understood by elite people who like to categorize and understand things to make themselves seem cool. And that's interesting, but it's also kind of unhelpful here. Like, that is different from, can this person or animal communicate via language? And these animals could do that before we introduced human-centered AAC into the mix. They have their ways of communicating that we ignored to superimpose our own views of what qualifies as communication on top of. Communication is an interaction between a speaker and a listener in order to effectively convey an idea. That's it. And that is what everybody here is and was doing. And the discussion of signing apes usually leans in the direction of where should the line be drawn with anthropomorphizing animals and trying to see them as humans when they're fundamentally not humans. But I also want to introduce into the conversation, where should we draw the line with de-anthropomorphizing humans based on communication? And why do we use communication as a measure of worthiness? Because we seem more concerned with how we can communicate with animals rather than how animals communicate with each other or how we can communicate with other humans who communicate atypically. Because AAC, the thing that has been thrown around this whole video as, oh, we're teaching alternative communication methods to animals to try to communicate with them, these tools were created for disabled people. They're created as ways for non and semi-speaking people, for differently speaking people, for otherwise disabled people with communication challenges to communicate. Physical AAC options, such as iPads with soundboards on them, not unlike the one that Bunny uses, are often not covered by insurance. Kids who struggle with communication are often told that if they're given alternative communication methods, they will never learn to speak, and therefore if we deny them any communication, they will be forced to learn to communicate in the way that's easiest for us. We force people and animals to communicate in ways for our benefit that is not really for their benefit or what they seem to want to do, refusing to change how we communicate and meet in the middle. Like, these kits on how to teach your dog how to speak with these buttons talk so much about how you need to be patient, how dogs may take many minutes to press a button in a conversation, and how 
it's because they are learning and they are being thoughtful and we need to be patient for that. Only for a human AAC user to be completely ignored because nobody has the patience to wait for an AAC user to type something out. Like, people will take every single word button pushed by a dog into consideration and make sense of everything they said. When for disabled people, they'll just go, oh, it's condition responses, it's random presses of a button, there's no way they have the competence to actually understand language. There are fundraising campaigns for dog communication that make a lot of money for dogs who naturally very comfortably communicate. Meanwhile, people fundraising for AAC devices for themselves get little to no money when they fundraise. Like, genuinely dogs have more access to alternative communication options than disabled human children and adults in a lot of cases. Not to mention the fact that people are already starting to see AAC users in real life and go, oh, you're like that dog I saw on TikTok, which I hopefully don't need to elaborate why that is an issue. There's also the element of intelligence and bioethics to go into. Many laws protecting animals were pushed forward in response to Coco's ability to sign. People suddenly started caring once they learned that maybe animals have higher cognition after all. We didn't start to realize that other animals might also possess intelligence until we found other ways to measure it, like puzzles. But I cannot express how weird and also slightly alarming it is to equate an animal's worth to its intelligence based on human standards of what intelligence is, because we've seen where this path leads us before, and it's eugenics. So at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether language is conditioned or not, or whether it's legitimately language or not. Truly, this discussion has happened over and over and over, and it always comes to the same messy, confused conclusions. What matters here is that we should be treating animals with kindness and care, and that if we hold animal communication via AAC so close to our hearts and are so willing to accommodate for it, I don't know, maybe we should do the basic right thing and give humans access to that communication and accommodate for that communication in life with humans as well. Like, maybe we should see all communication as valid communication, no matter the origins or the intentions or whatever. It's communication. Let's listen to it. Maybe we should spend more energy and more time trying to find a middle ground for communication rather than forcefully making other people communicate in the way we declare will be the most useful for them because it's the easiest for us. And most importantly, we need to stop equating communication with measures of intelligence and measures of worthiness and capability based on that intelligence. Because the moment that you do that, you erase the intelligence and worthiness and capability and autonomy of every single human who uses alternative or atypical communication methods. Like, this may seem like a fun and interesting discussion on the nature of language on the surface, and that's how I usually come across it online, but underneath it, there are some really, really harmful, outdated, and eugenicist beliefs that are still getting people involuntarily sterilized, institutionalized, and killed today. The stuff is still happening, people still don't have access to communication, and maybe instead of supporting a dog that uses AAC, we should... I don't know, try to support the humans who use it. Listen to what the humans have to say with just as much curiosity and care as you would Bunny the dog on TikTok. Disability shouldn't suddenly become something you care about when a cute animal uses a tool for disabled people that is weird, and the fact that I need to go, hey, maybe treat all living beings equally with care and compassion, regardless of ability, regardless of what they are capable of doing, rather than choosing who to care about based on who's capable of whatever you classify as language or communication or sentience. That's very weird to me, and I shouldn't need to say that. But anyway, that's all I have for today. I did not expect this video to go in this direction, but I guess we all learned something. Thank you to my friends for helping me talk through some of the philosophical and ethical questions of this one, particularly my AAC user friends. Um, also, please let me know what you think about this in the comments down below, though unkind and or vaguely eugenicist comments will be removed. Um, and as always, thank you for listening. Thank you for learning. Remember, it's never too late to start over. I look forward to seeing you right here in the next one.